You're listening to Back to the Roots Podcast. I'm Mike Klein, along with Brian Wood. Uh, today we are joined uh, by Ernest Weaver, who is a forage consultant for Byron Seeds, and also Tim Klein, uh, who is also a consultant for Byron Seeds. Uh, you might know Tim Klein. He was on an earlier episode with his wife, Katie, uh, Life on an Amish Dairy Farm. So I just want to thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. And Ernest, if you could just give us a uh, short introduction on your, your history, your background, and, and where you are and what your job is right now. All right. Well, I grew up on a dairy farm in southern Illinois, and about when I was, I left the farm when I was about 18, went into industry and came back about four years later. And in the time I was gone, my brother, who was the farm manager, went from taking it to a conventional dairy farm to a grazing farm. And I thought at first that he was stupid, but um, (laughs) I went along with the flow. And so um, ended up getting into the grass seed business uh, about 25 years ago and looking for better forages for, for for our farm, first of all. And we were grazing about 150 dairy cows and about 80 beef cows. And so... Um, I had a lot of hands-on grazing experience in the early days, um, and um, so I would work very closely with Samuel Fisher, and we had um, he also had a farm in Indiana, and so we worked were back and forth, and and um, did were heavily in the grazing movement, but then we realized that the grasses that were good for the cows that were grazing were also excellent feed for the cows that were in a barn and so we start targeting uh, bringing grass to confinement dairies as well as uh, on the grazing farms and so uh, get an opportunity to work with all sizes of farms uh, some conventional um, some died in the wool 100 percent grazing and and uh, and a lot of hybrid farms and quite a few organic. So it's uh, been a learning experience, and I feel like I've learned some through the years, but <laughs> a lot more to go. So when when did you, when did that farm become a grazing dairy, your family farm, uh, and when did you start working with Samuel Fisher, who is the founder and owner of Byron Seeds? Uh, so when, what years would that have been? All right, that farm would have become going to more of a to a grass based farm in the late eighties. Would have been like nineteen eighty eight, eighty nine is when we planted our first pasture. You know, for for dairy cows. Um, what drove that decision? I know that was a down that was down dairy price. Their, their milk price was that what drove that decision because that was not that was long before the grazing uh craze. explosion yeah exactly yeah. well my brother had was in the process of buying 50 percent of the cows and the equipment from my dad and he had that set up on a 10-year buyout program and um he was coming along nicely but he didn't think it was fast enough and he was reading about some of the grass grass farming and and ended up subscribing to Stockman Grass Farmer and and listening to Allen Nation and decided that he could produce milk more cheaply with grass than he could um, conventional and we were one of the top herds in southern Illinois when he stopped the conventional route and went the grazing so it wasn't that he didn't have production but he just felt that that the total farm income uh, could be improved and the profitability could be improved. And that would have been, like I said, in the late 80s, early 90s when that was taking place. And, and you started taking an interest in the grass seed side. Would that have been the early 90s then? That would have been more the mid-90s. And I was, I'm was i sitting here trying to think now, but I guess it would have been, um, well, in the later 90s, 96, I think, was when I got involved in the grass seed side of things. Uh, my wife and I were running 
a feed business, and we were selling to the dairy farms in the uh, in the area around us. Um, and some of the dairy farms were ask, dairy farmers were asking us if we would take on this dealership uh, for for grass seed, and and so they actually drug me into it. And that would have been '96, I think, when I started. Uh, Samuel started, I believe, in 1995, uh, 94, 95, and I came on in 96. So when it started, you know, when you had hay and you weren't grazing, your your grass seed mixes were, or your forage mixes were clearly very different. And when you when you talk to um, hay growers now, especially in, in the Midwest and the Mideast, you know, Indiana going east, you're not trying to raise a pure straight alfalfa. You, you're bringing the grasses into it, which works great for the grazing and also the feed like you mentioned. But when did that shift really start? Was it with the grazing movement or was it later? It was actually the grazing movement that brought to light the fact that the best cool season forages were not alfalfa but were grass. Grass was considered to be something subpar to alfalfa, and a lot of times we sprayed grasses out. Now, it's true that some of the volunteer grasses we had in our alfalfa were lowering the quality, but the grazing movement was what introduced the grasses that are actually superior quality uh, to alfalfa. And for the first time, the industry was forced to look at, guess what, there is something that is better than alfalfa. And, of course, it's a lot easier to grow uh, in, in many situations. And, um, and it's also really, really good for the soil. And as this whole movement was starting, there was a, there was a, a push toward improving soil quality as well. And there's nothing that will improve soil like grassroots. So when that first started, were you talking just – you know, I wasn't around at that time. So let's say you're now just throwing one type of grass in with your alfalfa at that point in time. At, at that point in time, we were. In fact, I can tell you the first mix that my brother seeded was was alfalfa and orchard grass. That was the very first pasture um, that we went in into, and so it was. It wasn't very long. In fact, very. Right after or our connection with Byron started uh, in in ninety five, uh, when we got first product from Samuel, and that was a mixture, a blend of grasses and clovers, uh, and actually no alfalfa, and so that was a that was like a new <laughs> step, but we started producing quality forages that were just unbelievable. Actually, we had better grass coming out of our pastures than we had coming out of our corn silage, our, you know, our silos. And it's also interesting, that was the first we were introduced to the newer genetics from Europe. That's correct. So they had greatly improved grass genetics, and that really helped swing the shift because all of a sudden we could grow grasses that were very high quality because they put the emphasis on the grass breeding just like the U.S. did on alfalfa. That's right. So was that the original normal old orchard grass, or was that genetically, or not genetically enhanced, but through plant breeding, was that the better varieties of orchard grass, or was that the, because I still remember as a little kid growing up, Dad hated orchard grass, Mm -hmm. because he said as soon as the snow melts, it's in head. Mm -hmm. And this would have been improved orchard grasses, but... To, to put perspective on it, I would say that that the orchard grass breeding in Europe was probably 10 to 20 years ahead of what it was here in the United States. And so the very first that we planted, um, or that my brother Claire planted there in, in, um, in the 80s would have been a little better than the stuff that your dad hated so badly but it certainly wasn't the stuff that he came to like eventually Mm -hmm. 
So was the was the consensus kind of like the grasses were um, Kentucky thirty one? You know, well, was that you know the grasses had no value and was was back then? I want to say I was way too young to remember, um, <laughs> but I might not have been. Uh, was the forage test still relative feed value, or was the relative feed quality test, the RFQ test, already in play? Because that really came with the introduction of grasses into your forage crop, correct? Right. And the, the relative feed value really only fits well to alfalfa. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the only place it has much place as far as I'm concerned. Before um, you go further, can you explain the difference between, because I don't honestly know the difference between RFQ, RFQ, RFQ okay. versus RFQ. Um, relative feed value was was a an estimation of overall quality based on some of some testing primarily testing the fiber that was in the in alfalfa for example and based on their reading of the fiber they would estimate the rest of the quality now rfq which came on much later brought in added to the equation and what it added to the equation was the digestibility of the fiber. Now, the fiber in alfalfa is not very good, and so we always tried to make low fiber hay with alfalfa. The fiber in alfalfa, oh, in grass, is much more digestible, or can be much more digestible. And so when we would just take a measurement of fiber and then say this is what the quality is, you could have a good grass and a good alfalfa the alfalfa would test dramatically higher than the grass because the grass was showing there's way too much fiber in. The problem was the fiber was a lot better in the grass and digestible fiber that is extremely important to the energy that the cow can harvest from the plant. And so RFQ is a much more accurate um, summary of 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 the quality um it's still some people would say needs help you know but it still gives us an idea mm-hmm. where we're at it gives us a benchmark to start from and rfq uh no it wasn't we were running everything with rfvs back then rfq was so rfq sense. would encompass the whole plant structure that's in the sample not just basically testing the Legume well, basically, within the sample? basically what RFQ does over RFV, it just takes a look at the digestibility of the fiber. And, and, and so you're estimating total feed value, but it gives you one more point of reference. And that one point of reference is really, really huge when it comes to estimating the value of grass. Because it's not factoring in net energy or anything like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So what, let's, you know, we're 96 right now. So let's go up through the 90s. What in the first 10 years of being introduced to the grasses, you know, the grazing aspect, adding grasses to your forage crop? What what changed over the first 10 years from, let's say, 96 up to, let's go up to 2010 and then look at the last 10 years? So what what really got you excited early on in the in the grasses in the hay mix okay what really got us excited to start with was just bringing in the european genetics and we were i mean this was like coming to the race and instead of coming to the horse race with a welsh pony we were actually bringing a thoroughbred and and so it was a difference of night and day and i'll give you an illustration of what happened we would always feed um, grain to the cows when before milking, and so we would flip on the the uh, the mixer and the bunk conveyor, and the cows would hear that, and they knew that they were going to get a little bit of grain, several pounds of grain, run out on the on the bunk feeder, and they'd all jump up from the pasture and come up because hey, we're going for candy. 
And that was just a normal way. It was a great way to get the cows up, flip the mixer on, turn the conveyor on. Here they come. Um, I still remember the first time that we turned cows out and they start grazing some of these European grasses. We flipped the mixer on and whistled, called the cows, and they just laid there. And we honestly thought, something's wrong. I mean, are these cows sick? What's <laughs> happening? I mean, nobody's coming. I actually had to go out in the pasture and chase the cows in. And they came in, and they went around the bunk feeder, and some of them sniffed at the corn. Some of them ate a little bit. But over half the corn was still left laying in the bunk when those cows went into the barn to get milked. I We couldn't believe it. Cows that actually liked grass so well they filled up on the grass to where they didn't eat ground corn that was that was the shocker and so like i said the european genetics were huge and and we're so far removed from that that sometimes we forget uh the number one grass that's used in the midwest today is still a 1931 model grass probably one of the stupider things that we do in farming Um, i used to be more kind and the way i talk about it (laughs) it's foolishness it's really foolishness and yet so many even grazing gurus are promoting oh we can work with it we can work with it yeah it has toxins yeah it's poisonous but you know we can manage it and kind of get along with it um i don't understand why they stay with a 1931 kentucky 31 that 31 comes from the year 1931 so we made a quantum leap when we went with the with the Dutch grasses, um, and when I say Dutch, because we got a lot of grasses out of Holland, some of the first grasses we got in came from New Zealand, and they were super quality, but they didn't persist because New Zealand doesn't have winter, and the more harsher continental climate of Holland um, and mainland Europe brought to us winter hardiness. Uh, on grasses that not that made them go dormant when they were stressed and so they would also go dormant when our hot summers stressed them and so the european grasses were more what we needed than the new zealand grasses even though even though the new zealand grasses were excellent quality they just weren't bred to take our environment but that was a huge leap in the in the fur in in the beginning now in the last 10 years one of the things that the awareness of soil health has grown significantly and and the call for for no magic bullets but balance going back to a balance in soil fertility making sure everything that is everything that is there that is needed to grow a quality plant um, that has been probably what I find to be the most exciting, even though I don't sell any fertilizers. <laughs> I just recommend people getting soil fixed and maintained. And, and that growth and understanding that there's so much more than just N, P, and K, for example, to making the system work. The awareness of the biology in the soil, and I realize there's huge amounts we still don't know, but we're much, much, much more aware of it and have become much more aware of it in the last 10 years. And as we bring these soils forward and increase the biology in the soil and the soil health comes up, we are growing higher quality forages than we ever did before. So that's that's really gets me stoked when I see what can be done when soils are brought back more into the way they were designed and when they were Mm -hmm. created. So who was the first company to bring in European seed? You know, the grass seeds from Europe and really promote grasses uh, into the forage production. Well, there's a gentleman, and right now his name slips my mind. Um, He was actually in Oregon. Do you remember who Tim... The first guy we used, John K. John K. was the name. Um, he was one who was bringing these uh, products in, and I, he brought a, a fair amount of, of uh, 
grass in from a uh, Dutch company called Berenberg. And and so Berenberg was a Holland-based company, and they decided through, at least from John Kay's influence, to actually establish Berenberg USA. And so they were, I guess, one of the, in my mind anyway, one of the first European companies to really get a beachhead established in the United States. And so um, there were there were some companies that were importing seed from New Zealand. Um, but I think Berenbrug, as the Dutch company, was probably one of the one of the leaders anyway in bringing stuff, material grasses from from a country that was similar to the Midwest to where where we could grow them very successfully here. Mm-hmm. Because I remember, would that have been, Tim, would that have been like the late 90s, early 2000s, where ryegrass was just, everybody was just going crazy about ryegrass, then they realized we get 90 degrees and dry in August? Mm -hmm. Is that when that would have been, Tim? Yeah, I'm going to say, I'm trying to think when I started farming, it would have been like 97, and ryegrass was the rage. Everybody was planting it, and it was a phenomenal grass on the right soils, but so much of it was put on, on thin soils, and it just didn't produce. Um, the great thing on the on what got everybody's attention was, even though it might die off a little, or go dormant in the hot summer, when cool fall rains came, it would just explode again, and the cows just absolutely loved it. And so ryegrass is probably the one that introduced, in my opinion, in the you know in the Mid East East, probably more people to the European grass than any other grass. And then like the first orchard grass that I was introduced to. All of a sudden, the heading date was 10 days later, and that was the difference between making dairy quality first cutting hay or not, and that's when Dad converted. I can still remember one of his neighbors when he saw that Dad planted orchard grass. He, again, he said the end of the world can't be far off because he was just so adamant, but that 10 days was absolutely huge. And the other thing that is always interesting about the improved grasses as a rule, as they breed them for later heading, their seed production tends to tail off a little bit. So even if it did go reproductive, it didn't. The quality was better than the older varieties. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, last week. I was talking to Sam Dobson, who uh, was on our podcast uh, at an earlier episode, and he said, you know, he in, he's in North Carolina, and they raise a lot of ryegrass, and because they go through a serious summer slump. He said, dairy quality ends when the seed heads appear. And he said, when you're fattening steers, you've got three, on grass-fed steers, he said, you've got three weeks left with seed heads, and they'll still eat it. He said, dairy quality and beef quality is different, and he's finally figured that out. But what he's getting excited about is the newer grasses that are coming out for the grass-fed beef side. Um that he said is even going to work better for him on the dairy side. He said if he doesn't get through with the dairy cows, to bring the beef herd in. Uh, so it, it was kind of weird. He had a meeting in, in Holmes County last week, and I was at the meeting. It was kind of kind of neat. We were talking about grasses, and now we're sitting down with you, so it's kind of a nice tie-in for me personally, not necessarily for people listening. But <laughs> And the grass – I. One of the things that I think of in, in in the grazing movement is there are there are parts in the world, there's parts in the United States uh, where they graze cattle um, all year, basically twelve months out of the year, and that's nice when you can do that. But in the lower Midwest, especially where we don't freeze consistently and we have wet winters, we have a lot of mud. And so stored feed, if we're out on pastures, once we have these beautiful pastures established, if we have cattle out on them all winter, we destroy them. And and so stored feed, I think, is a key, even in the grass-fed market, um, whether the cow, whether you take the cow to the grass or the grass to the cow, uh, either way, she can be benefited by the grass. 
Now, of course, we like the grazing concept. We like to be save on diesel and save on energy and have the cow do the harvesting. And I, I'm, I'm great with that. But I think the stored feed enables us to manage better in the time, in the crisis time. Um, and, and we can actually use the stored feed to keep the, the energy requirements that the animal needs there and also to protect our swords in our in our pastures because i think sometimes we we tend to overlook the fact that you can really degradate your soil Mm -hmm. by keeping cattle on it in wet weather that's right um when you look at a thousand pound animal there's eight little pads where that animal is standing on and that is a lot of compaction happening so i totally agree with you get those paddle or those cattle off of the, that field where you've got a really good sward and feed them that feed that you made. Right. Just as good a quality. Well, it's maybe not just as good, but it's good quality feed. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I want to shift a little bit um, going, staying with the grasses, but with grass-fed beef and grass-fed dairy um, tends to, there, there's a shift toward the grass-fed beef side and also on the grass-fed dairy uh, for grass milk. Um, the limiting factor is energy. Yes. Um, I think we all know that. Um, what What do you see happening? Um, because corn silage is a wonderful source of energy for cows. What can be, for guys that are trying to make milk through the winter on stored feed, um, I'm using Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin as an example because, like you said, mud um, and no no pasture. What what can farmers feed to get that energy and still be on an all grass diet? Well, the thing that happens is corn silage enables us to take like twenty five, twenty eight ton of uh, as fed feed off an acre. And it's high in energy, and so it's it was a simple way to get a lot of feed with a lot of energy in a single cut, and so it helped in the labor situation, which becomes a challenge um, on on our farms today. Uh, and so we looked for a corn silage replacement. What could we use in the place of corn silage? Um, and so we looked at first of all corn that wouldn't put any grain on the ear, male sterile. Um, and it's an exciting concept and we're still looking at it. We're still working at it. Uh, but the trouble is escape pollen contamination, maybe in the seed possibly, or even simply from the neighbor's field, because we can have pollen travel hundreds of yards. Um, and it can even travel miles. Um, I've been told that during pollination season, there is a significant amount of of uh, pollen can be collected off the top of the Willis Tower in Chicago, and so we have these we have corn pollen that can move a significant distance, and so we have this male sterile corn pollen comes in and all of a sudden we have something that is much much lower starch than normal corn silage but doesn't fit for the um you know for the requirements for grass fed and so we tried male sterile sorghums and they could be could work but the trouble is any johnson grass or any shatter cane or any neighboring sorghum sedan that a neighbor might let go into head, that pollen can actually travel further than corn pollen can. And so once again, we ran into a situation where we would have a crop that was supposed to be sterile. We would have renegade pollen coming in, and all of a sudden we would have a silo full of feed that we couldn't feed and maintain our grass-fed status. So Johnson grass... Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in where I live in central Ohio. We're on the northern edge of Johnson grass. But you're saying that could pollinate sorghum? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. So then, is that a 
sorghum Johnson grass hybrid or what, how does that work? <laughs> I guess it would be. Uh, but like I said, there's enough of, there's enough of genetic similarities that that pollen can be accepted. Um, uh, male pollen, um, can be accepted by that, uh, um, plant that doesn't produce any pollen. So yes, Johnson grass and shatter cane, both are what wild. Is, what is shatter cane? Uh, shatter cane is actually a, a crop or it's not a crop, but it's a weed that looks very similar to sorghum. Uh, but in some parts of the Midwest has been a major weed issue. Um, and, and it would go up, put a seed head on that look kind of like sorghum and just, um, could spread, be a significant prolific seed producer. And so it was, uh, a wild, um, a wild cane mm-hmm. that is, can also pollinate sorghum. Tim would, when, when like the, the combine would hit that shatter cane, it would just sound like hail on the head. You know, it just hard seeds. It, would it, it just It just shatters. That Hence does the, the name. name. Does the yeah. name. Yeah. Okay, so would we be too far north in Ohio to have shatter cane? Uh, if you want to see shatter cane, go down uh, across 189 just before you cross the Martins Creek Bridge. Look to the right. That cornfield has a beautiful crop of shatter cane and, and uh, the front part of the field. And it probably, I would say, doubles or triples in size every year. The spot, it started out as a couple plants. For example, I have had one plant of Johnson grass when I moved on our farm 10 years ago. One clump, and I grazed it, I mowed it, I have plowed it four times. It is still there. And now I have one more clump where a bird carried the seed or something. So it is, it's not impossible to get rid of, but basically you have to dig it up. Yeah. That's why the organic producers in Kentucky carry hoes and shovels on their cultivator to dig mm-hmm. out Johnson grass. And the other thing in that is when we're producing the seed, a high percentage of the sorghum seed gets produced in Texas. And so they're going to have miles of boundary between them and the, this male sterile they're producing and any other pollen source, which, of course, they have Johnson grass down there as well to deal with. And so they go around for miles spraying this Johnson grass to keep the pollen down. The only trouble is sorghum pollen can travel seven miles or more. And so, you know, you get one of those windy days um you know, that uh, Texas can sure produce, and guess what? All that it takes is, like, we get some contamination. The pollen comes in on the seed production field. All the sorghum looks the same. It's harvested. And yet, so this is all male sterile, except we got 1% in there of contaminated seed. And then those come up, and 90, 90, 99, 98%, of those are sterile, but guess what? We got one or two percent, and boy, they shed the pollen. And then all of a sudden, we have a ten percent starch content, and again, it's a problem. So now, the thing I'm excited about right now, I think I maybe have an answer, not a perfect answer, but we use male sterile millet that are not receptive to to wild pollens, and so. These BMR6 male sterile millets, we plant them in 30-inch rows like we do corn and let them mature, but they're going to be too green because unlike a corn plant that once it matures, it dies, this plant is still alive. And so we actually wait for frost to kill the top leaves, the top of the plant, and then when frost kills it, and it dries down, we can get our total plant moisture down into the 60s, upper 60s. And then if we chop that at at least like a one-inch chop length, I think we can put that in upright silos and have very little juicing and have a product that is going to be similar in quality to corn silage and similar in yield to corn silage in the... um, in the central midwest now that is a warm season plant and so the further north we go um 
the less production we will get. But in mm-hmm. central Midwest, in, in central Indiana, we've got 25 ton of silage per acre off of it. So what is the problem with silage juicing? Well, a couple of things. When, 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 when you have silage juicing, you're losing nutrients. I mean, that's running. You've got nutrients running out. Of course, it's an, uh, uh, also a, an acidic product. And so it, uh, that acid will be hard on the silo, hard on the unloaders, hard on mm-hmm. whatever. Um, so it's, it's nutrient loss and then increased uh, caustic ability of the mm-hmm. silage to eat up concrete. and Because and, uh, that is some really, really nasty stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So is, will it take less heat units? Than a sorghum crop, the millet, or about the same? I think it's going to take about the same. Okay. I think it's going to take about the same, but it's something that we're looking at being able to produce and with with very low risk of starch. Um, now, I think I can take sorghum north further, and so uh, sorghum is a little more aggressive coming out the gate than millet but uh, yeah we're we're still seeing how far we can take it just where all it's going to fit but in the central midwest for the grass only um fellas i think they really need to start looking at it seriously um it's it's of the size um that will work well even with a uh, bindering system that a lot of our amish friends are using and so we can binder it um, and could you could you drill that and swath it, or do you need it you, to mature to get the energy in it? You could drill it and and swath it, um, but by letting it go to maturity, we are looking for more sugar production and and a greater energy capturing with the plant. Um, and also, still looking at this one cut situation, uh, where corn silage with a relatively small amount of labor, we can get a lot of stuff produced in a short time. Um, so yes, it could be swath, but a lot of again, a lot of the the uh, Amish farms aren't really set up for handling haylage well. And especially some of the farms I work with where they're haylage, they are still handling, making it in with small square bales. And that's incredibly backbreaking work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think I think this, to have a single cut where you would binder it just like you would corn silage, uh, if we can make that work, and it looks extremely promising, Mm-hmm. Um, I, I definitely think if I can tell you, uh, if my cows were on a grass only truck, I would be planting a bunch of it this year. Can Do you graze it? Yes, it can be grazed. The other thing with bindering that I think would have potential, you could binder it and leave the bundles lay and get s- some dry down, you know, on the outer leaves. Right, you know, so you could have the potential there, or if a person was really aggressive, he could bind it and set up, kind of set him up in a little shock for two or three days. But right. that's more labor. Right, that is more labor, but that's also the option, the unfair advantage. <laughs> we look at at the modern uh, producers as having you know all the fancy equipment, but actually, when we back up a number of years to where we're using a binder. What Tim said is absolutely true, and I've had fellows who've done that for years, binder and and let it out in the field for a couple of days to dry. Uh, and, and again, they would be able to take it in, blow it in their silos, and have very little juicing coming out of it. That's, uh, for the farmers that I work with, that's exciting to me yeah. because if we could get something in a silo or a bag, high-energy, for them to make milk during the winter is really, really going to be beneficial, and and you would you would cultivate it and just treat it like a corn crop, right? Absolutely, yeah. It canopies a lot better than corn. 
Um, if you got like if you're looking for something between the rows, if you drop a pair of glasses or a pocket knife, you almost need a uh, flashlight to go down there and look for it because it canopies and it's thick. So, but you're going to have to take care of weeds early on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm excited about it because I've been looking for years for an answer uh, for the guys in the grass fed, um, grass only situations mm-hmm. and for the first time i truly think i've got something that will work how far north can that go that's a good question and that's what we have to find out and you know obviously as we go north you know depending where a fellow is you know do we have lake effect i mean are we going to be able to extend our growing season you know we go up north of green bay uh for example we can grow some some corns up there that significantly south of green bay might not work well but they have the lake effect there that's that's influencing their weather so we got to find out how far north Mm -hmm. and that's that's those questions we're going to be trying to answer them uh, this coming year so what you should do is bring like a truckload of that into holmes county this year and just do plots on all the grass-fed farms there yeah, like and I 30 think, acre plots or something. Yeah, I, I, I think 30 acre plots. I'm I'm actually excited about it, and I have permission to do that um, with or, Organic Valley buying the seed, uh, and we can give it out. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've got the green light to go ahead. With <laughs> if, you, if you stop and think about it, at five pounds an acre, one bag, 50 pounds of seed will plant 10 acres. Mm-hmm. So we're talking the a semi-load would cover a bunch of acres, and the, it's low it's, cost. Are you serious on the five pounds I'm yes. per acre? Oh, absolutely. In fact, if we can get that five pounds lower, it would be fine. Um, it's from a seed cost side of things, it's ridiculous. Uh, it is really ridiculously the, low. The other nice thing about it is, you know, we all have pasture fields that we turned the cows out, we got a rainstorm, and they got tore up or whatever, so we renovate because typically they, the grass fields primary usually, I know the rage is permaculture or, you know, all that, but uh, for, from a production standpoint on limited acres, the pastures tend to peak production at about the third year. And then after about five years, they start tailing off in production. So if you've got your livestock anyway, and you put your winter manure on that field at four to five pounds an acre, and you can get 25 ton of feed, just look at the low cost, plus you can renovate your field. So, you know, it, it's just, it's it sounds like it's almost too good to be true. It's not good for the, for the seed sale no. side of things, you know. Because you're just not seeding a lot, because the seeds right. are re- much much smaller than sorghum seeds. And you could plant it with a corn planter, like a platelet planter would work, or no? No, I don't. Well, I don't. I wouldn't say so. Uh, we use like plate planters, and we're using sugar beet sh- or canola plates work the best. But I, th- to me, I think the best option would be plugging holes on the drill. If you can set it down far right. enough, and if you key. if you plug holes in the drill, you can get thirty inch rows. But just remember, an organic situation, we got to be able to cultivate. Mm-hmm. You know, so we get a row straight enough that that's. If um, you just have a one row cultivator, it's really not that big of a deal. That's true, and if you have <laughs> GPS on your horse, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on that one. <laughs> but what is the cost like per pound? Well, last year, and and I don't know exactly what it is this year because I think it's actually going to come down a bit, but I think last year the the most expensive that we had was like $110 for a 50-pound bag. Um, So you're talking like 12 bucks an acre. I am talking ridiculously low seed cost. This is is seed cost in general, and, and, you know, hey, it's easy for me to talk here but as a seed guy at any meeting when i stand up and say you know what really seed cost is one of the smallest parts of your investment that's true even when we're even when you're making planting pretty expensive seeds but i'm telling you this takes it to a whole new level as far as low inputs on seed cost Mm -hmm. 
that's not the why we're doing it just because it's cheap seed um but we're we're doing it because this is the only way that i've found to meet the criteria for an energy plant that is going to fit the grass mm-hmm. only criteria consistently how do you think it will work in the in a beef setting oh i think it'll work fantastic in a beef setting now course in a beef setting and in a a grass finish situation you're probably going to be grazing this stuff through the summer and you can graze sorghum sedan as well Uh, but can we stockpile it uh, to where we can graze for an extra month and a half i think we can i think we i think it will work great for a strong energy source in fact right now i've got uh, i've got uh, calves coming up from our farm in the south uh, and what's waiting for them is baled millet, and they're they're going for grass grass finish, mm-hmm. and a uh, millet is a key part of that for me. So how, if you were to stockpile, would you would you say graze it off a couple of times and then stockpile, or would you like let it grow to twenty five tons an acre and then run a in after frost? Yeah, you got to remember at 25 tons the acre, this stuff is only going to be about five and a half feet tall. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be that. Uh, it's a very workable, just a bushy, very bushy plant. Um, I think it depends on what you need, uh, the timing of when you need tonnage and so forth. Um, it can obviously be grazed multiple times and will regrow and then can be left grow for a stockpile but if i'm going to grow and get maximum tonnage on it like i'm talking on the 25 tons i'm going to need probably 90 to 100 days of growth anyway to Mm -hmm. get that That but multiple grazing would take care of any lodging issues or would help with the lodging right but i don't we have not seen any lodging we've had it reside right beside multiple sorghums that were lodging here and there and everywhere um and and this stuff's just stood. So I don't think lodging is going to be an issue. And the other thing we always also have to remember, these are the first brown midribs yes. to come out. So that's where we're gaining the quality over the old, you know, German millets and right. the foxtail millets. These are, these these are, are BMR midrib. 6s, and they're, they, yeah, it's some excellent quality. Now, we did have lodging where it was planted too thick, you know, but uh, we have to, we, we've got to keep the seeding rate back so it can so if thicken. if you were going to want to graze this and then stockpile it for the fall would you then be better off to drill it and still stay at five pounds an acre or would you up the seeding rate then if you were to graze it and try to stockpile you know the drilled version if i was going to graze it i would definitely stockpile i, I mean if i was going to graze it i would definitely drill it um and because when you have the cows running over it and chewing, especially if you graze it too hard, you're probably going to damage your stand somewhat. And so, you know, for stockpiling it, I would go that low seeding rate. Um, and for grazing, I would go the drill with a higher seeding rate, you know. So to do both in the same, it's probably, probably it's not going to be my pick. Mm-hmm. Could maybe be done, but I I would be, I would be a little loath to do it. Certainly, you're. I, I wouldn't plan on twenty five ton, mm-hmm. but maybe maybe I could graze. I could drill it and graze it twice, and still have say twelve ton of feed out there on, on a wet basis. Mm-hmm. And if it did go down, they'll they'll lick it up. Mm-hmm. This is this is exciting to me, uh, and. Being this is the first BMR six that's come out, can you explain the BMR thing? Yeah, BMR because I don't understand the whole BMR right. thing. The BMR is brown midrib, is what that stands for, and that's simply going to be you're going to see in the center of the leaf a brown streak, and what makes that is actually phenolic compounds that the plant normally uses to produce lignant. But BMR is a mutation, just like the Angus cow fails to grow a horn, and so it's a mutation, but it's a good mutation. Uh, 
this sorghum plant or millet plant, as in this case, in this case fails to build the normal amount of lignant. It's a, it's a mutation that is uh, beneficial. And so the digestibility of the fiber is higher. And, and so this brown midrib mutation has been bred into the plant to where the plant is just a lot more digestible. And one of the benefits as well, not only being more digestible, it's also more palatable. The animals like it better. And is, is this going to, this is just coming out, do you see significant advances being made going forward to better and better millet and better options? Well, okay, for just coming out, I mean, we've had we've had the BMR in the sorghums, and it has been a number of years that the the BMR millets have have been here, but we're really just bring pushing them a lot a lot more now than ever before. Um, will there be more advancements? Um, I think there will be because I feel like we're working with, with, uh, probably the best millet breeder in the world. <laughs> um, but the plant as we have it now is a fantastic plant. Uh, can it be improved on? Sure. We can all, you know, we can always probably improve them, but it's, it's a great plant. And I do, I really think that, um, it's more, yes, we'll breed other types of millet perhaps, but this is, it's more learning how, how to use it. How do I manage it? Um, and I think that's, that's, that's understanding the management and learning the management that we need, uh, to utilize it, um, is, is what we're chasing right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, the quality of the plant is sterling. It's amazing. It's got good standability, great digestibility, some of the best feed uh, that we've ever produced for a dairy cow. And so to all of a sudden, this is not the way the market brings this product forward. Uh, it was kind of a happenstance that we came on it, um, but uh, it's a blessing that's for mm -hmm. sure, and we're thankful for it. And it's, I really think we're on something to where we can, for once, harvest energy and store the energy that the grass-only market desperately needs. What kind of energy levels are you looking at? Well, what I would say is we're looking at at energy values that are going to be... A little less than corn silage, but probably similar to average corn silage. Um, the trouble is with this plant, I think it's still better than a test. <laughs> I think there's more energy there um, than, than what it will even show up on the feed test, but it does show up good. We're, we're talking about energy that is, is right up in the ballpark with corn silage. And the fiber, it's all coming from fiber and sugar. And the fiber portion is better than any corn that I've ever worked with. This is exciting. I'm, well, it's, it's exciting you know. to me because I feel for so long uh, that energy need, that the grass-only movement needed, we just didn't have. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like I'm getting my fingers around it. I'm getting a hold of something that can really make a difference on those farms. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking grass only, uh, this is primarily talking about a stored feed, winter energy. Yeah, um, more yeah. so. Uh, is there are there new grasses? Are there new mixes out that you think are going to really benefit from an energy standpoint that haven't been out for the last five years? We have some new grasses out. Um, Huge jumps ahead in energy, not necessarily. Um, the the energy production, especially when we're thinking of a grass, a graze grass, it was more day-to-day. -day, and so how much sunshine do we have is going to influence how much energy is there. 
we have have excellent grasses again, but what do we do when the water shuts off? Mm-hmm. When the when the temperature skyrockets and the water shuts off, and 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 so these summer annuals we're looking at help to fill bridge that gap. But here's something that isn't talked about, and and really this is the first time um, I'm. I believe that the root system that is under these millets and good quality BMR sorghum sedans, like we're working with in sedan grasses, are excellent soil builders. And so while we're harvesting more energy for, for cattle to eat, we're also putting more energy into the soil. More sugar is going to feed the microbes. And so we're actually building soil. Like Tim said, you know, several years, three years of grass production, and then we see it tapering off. Well, when we can come in a product like this that is going to have significant more root production than a corn plant, we can renovate with a soil-building crop, a tremendous soil-building crop, come right back in with grass. And guess what? The grass is going to be better than it was before. Mm-hmm. And so I think the sum total is the grasses that we had are going to be allowed to express their genetic potential better than they could before because we're actually building soil and building an environment in which they can thrive even better. And they grow longer into the summer and 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 longer into the drought because of what we're doing with the soil. Mm -hmm. So I think these summer annuals, it's not just the energy that we're feeding that the cows are getting this year. It's actually putting energy in the bank, in the soil bank. It's harvesting sunlight. It is harvesting sunlight. And it's it's something that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about. But I, Mm -hmm. I really, truly believe that the opportunity to build soil with these this type of summer annual is goes beyond anything that we've been doing up to this point as far as as building soils in the summertime well i've noticed in the past if i make if i have a field of sorghum sedan or a warm season annual and the field of corn right next to it and i harvest both of them and i plant them the same day with a new pasture seeding the one with the sorghum in it will it be at least two to three times as tall yeah two weeks later it just explodes out of the ground. And also, if you take a warm season annual plant and you pull it up out of the soil, if you don't find an earthworm or a bunch of earthworms in that root zone, you don't have any. Because they, they're drawn to that. They're, they're accumulate. You know, just, and the other neat thing is, you know, for what they do, you know, they have low levels of cyanide. The sorghums do. So they're a natural rootworm control because the rootworm does not differentiate a sorghum root from a corn root so they go and nibble on those those low levels of cyanide are not healthy for them (laughs) so if if you have rootworm in organic production and you the year before you plant corn you put a sorghum sedan in for example it'll it should take care take care of most of your rootworm pressure so you know it just it's just amazing to me always when i start that new pasture seeding you you look at it and you, you're trying to think you know these fields are two feet apart it just it's just a world of difference so you know there's some some action going on there that we can't actually measure or we don't have scientific data for but there is a difference mm-hmm. and i've i've heard that a lot with guys renovating pasture they love using a summer annual in their rotation to come back after a summer annual um, with a with a grass seeding and say it's just the success rate is off the charts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I believe that. So this yeah that's really interesting how you're and this goes back to John Kempf when we had him on. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said uh, contrary to popular belief, he thinks you can build soil faster growing corn than most other crops because of how much how much sunlight you're harvesting, which is kind of what you're talking about with the sorghums. But what you have happening with the corn is that corn is going to grow for what? Actively growing for about 90 days. Mm -hmm. And then we start to have a dry down, a die off, and the corn is dead long before the frost hits if it's planted early 
sorghum is going to be alive right up to the frost and probably even the first frost isn't going to kill it and it stays alive you go in and you can dig those roots up in november and there are still a live living root and you dig a corn plant up and they're decaying already mm -hmm. and so this plant is pumping sugars you know for example through the month of september when corn has normally long been done mm -hmm. uh, but again i understand where john's coming from is because we're talking about a root system we're talking about a solar collector uh but you think corn has leaves you ought to take a look at this melon. <laughs> um, incredible amount of leaves. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to do is have some farmers try this and then have them back on. So if it if it works, they get the accolades, and if it doesn't, we'll call them out on the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I would, I would be good with it because I know it works because we've mm -hmm. done it. Um, so... It was just interesting at the at the plots last year. You know, this whole group of people walking along, all of a sudden, what's this? You know, here was this millet planted in 30-inch rows at, I think he planted at two pounds because of malfunctioning on the planter. But, you know, it just, everybody, it caught everybody's attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, interesting stuff. I, I just, I'm excited where um, we're grazing and where, forage production how it's kind of evolved in the last 20 years and but it's never stopped so now with the grass-fed market coming around how the envelope keeps getting pushed and pushed and you know what can we do to gain weight on beef cows or make milk in the off season on stored feeds um this well, is one, really exciting stuff. One of those things, and we've talked a lot about specific varieties of grasses with the millets and corns and sorghums. One of the things that we haven't touched on that has been big over the last five to ten years, I'd say, is cocktail mixes. And mm -hmm. I'd like to talk a little bit about what you've seen with different varieties being mixed and the advantages for soil health and if there's a you know, I've heard a bunch of different things on you should put 60 different varieties in a mix or you should put there's no benefit after seven. Can you get into some of that kind of stuff and what you've seen? I can get into it. I'm not going to claim to have all the answers on it, uh, but I will be the first to admit that multiplicity of roots, different species bring different things uh, to to the table. Uh, we have the benefit of working with a, uh, a German company that has been in, in cover crop research for almost 100 years. And, and uh, they do work with some, uh, some complex mixes, although their complex mixes tend to be more in the, you know, in the 10 to 12 range more than the 60 i think the well, 60 I was exaggerating. thing well no <laughs> but no that but is there are people that, uh, yeah. yeah there are people that are doing the 30 yeah. and it, and and i think that's more i think that's fantasy and 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 i i don't see it a, a good return on the farmer's investment but multiple roots are important now when we come up with something where we're talking about a solar collection um for 90 days, for example, where we're trying to produce 25 ton of a very specific crop. Um, I think in that situation where we, when, and, and we have done some, some experimenting with multiple species planted together, but what I would like to see is multiple species growing and in the pasture or the hay field before and that have multiple species growing there and have that plowed down and then we come back with a with a monoculture simply from the ability to manage manage and grow uh grow it well and and, and one of the things i, I mean I, i'll pull an example out because wheat you know there's a lot of been done with wheat um and and um there's a there's a lot of wheat that's grown uh organic wheat that's grown for for food production but you know they basically grow wheat they don't mix 25 other things in with it 
you know, and it's a very specific thing that they're going after. Then we may come in with a cocktail of cover crops following or before that to, to get the, to get the stimulation from all those uh, different types of roots. But I think for what we're doing here, and for example, growing corn, you know, and a lot of organic guys that are not grass only are going to be growing corn. And can we increase our corn production by growing multiple things in? We were actually experimenting with that and and working with some things that we're planting in the corn. Um, one of the things that has been done this year that we did that I find to be very exciting is we planted a significant amount of winter peas, hundreds of pounds per acre of winter peas, and then planted the corn right in it, all planted at the same time. And so the corn came up and the peas came up, and the peas basically held back all the uh, grass and any weeds. It was never cultivated. We never cultivated it. Once the, once the, uh, once the winter peas got up to, oh, about 10, 12 inches, it start getting hot and start getting dry and they just died off and just kind of formed a mulch and the corn just took <laughs> off. And so zero cultivation, zero herbicide. I mean, it's just a, it was, it was pretty And neat. it was clean. It was clean. It was but, some of the cleanest corn you saw that, didn't you, Tim? Was but that then I'd have to go for therapy if I couldn't cultivate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and maybe we could get a pill for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so know, will to, the deer eat the peas? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. but then they'll eat the corn when they're in there too, which is all right if you're hunting the deer, but for your organic producer that's trying to make a living. As you can tell, Mike's been deer hunting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying so, to come up with things how to draw the deer close to his heated blind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I got him you know, within 40 yards. We're talking cocktails. You know, just look at what we've discovered in alfalfa. If we put four different, four or five different varieties of alfalfa in the same mix, it will always out yield and outperform a single species over and over variety or a single variety i'm sorry Mm -hmm. over and over and over again so you know is there a limit there you know because like you said you hear that 30 you hear the big you hear these big numbers and the theory behind that is you know and i'm just saying this for anybody listening is that you know, you get these multiple varieties, and when one suffers, you have roots from another that will be able and to benefit and, you know, you withstand droughts or different types of soil quality. But, you know, I got to believe that there's a there's a point of diminishing return right. there. Right, right. And I, I, I think that, and I, I, I know uh, Dr. Marvin Hall, uh, Penn State University, he's retired now, but uh, I believe – but um, he had he had done some extensive work with that, and you know he said you know seven or you know six to eight in that range. When they went beyond that, they actually not only saw a leveling off, but actually a decrease. Because when we're putting plants in there, we do need to make sure they are compatible. And we're only kidding ourselves if we think that all plants are always 100% compatible with each other because they're not. I mean, we use certain plants to hold back certain weeds, for example. And so what is the compatibility? And when I go out there and I throw 60 varieties or 60 species together, you can be pretty sure I haven't tested them all out. Well, it's kind of the whole theory versus reality. You know, with grass milk, you know, you get guys that think that sounds like wonderful theory right and then they actually do it and they're not the managers to be able to do it right. it's the same thing with growing a bunch of different for, it, right. it sounds wonderful when you think of the theory but then you actually mm-hmm. see reality and right you're paying a whole bunch of money to get a whole bunch of bags of seed around for six war- of them might come up <laughs> for right. a warm fuzzy feeling yes yeah, exactly. i guess my question is are those same people are they throwing every breed of cows in together you know Yes. You they know, very well might be. <laughs> Brahma's, Hereford, the whole ball of wax, you know, throwing them all together. I think the poor little Jersey would probably get beat up a little bit. So, you know, it's just, you know, I, there's, there's, there's value to it, but I think there is such a thing as going too far. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have mm-hmm. one really, since we have seed people here who understand how seeds work, why when you're seeding 
a grass or a forage mix and you stop the drill and then you take off again and a whole bunch of seeds drop down. Why is that two inches taller than any other part? That's a good question. That's a good observation too. Um, a lot of times uh, we seed fellows get accused of selling seed because our planting recommendations are higher than what the old university recommendations were and so forth. But there's actually competition, mm -hmm. what we would call healthy competition among those plants. And so where you seed it heavier or you'll see it at the end too, maybe where you crisscross with the mm -hmm. drill and you have double seeding rates, all of a sudden that stuff, it's not shorter because there's more there, but they actually stimulate each other. And there is what we call healthy competition among those plants and they grow. Okay. Because more. I was looking at that and thinking, okay, if it's a nutrient thing, <coughs> they should be shorter because there's more plants exactly. drawing nutrients yet they're taller, so it has to be a competition where I need to get the sunlight, I'm going to outgrow you, so I get the sunlight, and then, I mean, right. it's it's just weird. And, 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 and it's and it's always like that. It's always like that. And, and for the organic guys who struggle with weeds, I mean, for crying out loud, when you're starting a pasture, when you're starting a hay field, don't skimp on seeding rates. Because it's a win-win situation. I mean, it, when, when you get in there with a heavier seeding rate, they take off faster, they grow taller, and naturally shade out the weeds, you know. And so for an organic producer to be skimping on a seeding rate is, is not a wise thing at all. Well, when I first got involved with the seed business, you know, I started making recommendations for Dad, and he almost passed out. You know, I was telling him how many pounds per acre. I think that at that time we were probably more conservative than we are now, but, you know, we were looking at 25 pounds, and, well, he went ahead with it. And shortly after, he said, all these years of my farming, I wasn't putting enough out there. He was putting out maybe 15, 16 pounds an acre. And the thing was... In first cutting hay, we always had what we call white top, the white little daisy-looking things. They all went away because just that extra 6, 8, 10 pounds of seed, that stuff never got established. So your hay field just stayed so much cleaner. It was pretty cheap weed control. So, you know, it's not, it's, it, it, it's just... It's a no-brainer, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I remember your dad muttering one time about five pounds, you know, that the difference five pounds make and how many years he struggled with seedings and just extra five pounds, you know, mm -hmm. how much easier it made his life and, and how much better the return was. Mm -hmm. Well, are there any final thoughts you guys want to share? If not, I think we're going to wrap it up. Any new, anything exciting? No, just kidding. Uh, I, I really want to do, I really do want to thank you for, for joining us, Ernest, and Tim, you as well. Uh, if we've been looking forward to having a chance. We've been working on, what, a year and a half or so to try to find time and be at the same place at the same time. And, and uh, I really, really enjoyed the conversation tonight, so well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, and it was it was good to be here, and I I appreciate your program, and what you're doing, um, and on what the organic movement has done, and especially Organic Valley. I uh, I uh, applaud your efforts. Um, and there's there's few things in farming um, that excite me more than seeing um, what can be done. And I will share one thing with you um, that is incredibly exciting and powerful we test forages all the time and we have um the forage super bowl at madison and all forages from around the united states and are being are being tested there and exhibited um and it's always been a big thing for us and we have a lot of champions and we have a lot of ranking uh samples that are producers coming from our producers that are going in there, but the percentage of organic 
samples that are winning is getting increasingly higher. So what's happening is the best samples are starting to come from the organic farms. And that tells me that what I believed all along is that soil life and biology is so important to good, healthy production. And what organic movement has done has forced us to reevaluate how we treat our soils and has set the stage for us not only to grow just as much as we did before, but we can grow more. We can have soils that will yield more and definitely better. And, and, and when we're seeing that on the lab test, on forage tests, those forage samples coming off these farms, um, I know we're on the right track. That, that's Couldn't agree impressive. more. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Ernest. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Tim, thank you, too. Yep, yep, yep.